from the book of Psalms, Psalms 51, verse 17. I'm not going to have you look that up because we read it in our act of praise. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, thou will not despise. That's from 2 Corinthians. Now you can look this one up. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Found and say amen. If you're still looking at the table of contents, say wait. <laughs> Nobody said wait. But I have a sneaking suspicion that I need to wait just a minute. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to vision and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up in the third heavens, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities, for though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, and to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most clearly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, <coughs> in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Come and speak through us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Matthew Henry, the great theologian and the author of uh, one of the great commentaries of Christianity, was robbed as he traveled along the highway. And he wrote in his diary that evening, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took all, took my all, it wasn't that much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed and then I who robbed. The Christian faith affirms that one of the basic ingredients of faith is gratitude. Scripture encourages us to have it, and we benefit from it. God appreciates it, and we need more of it, not just gratitude, but gratitude to God. I guess you could say that I am on a one-man campaign this morning 
to encourage us that every time we hear someone say how thankful he or she is, we ought to say, yes, thank God. <coughs> One of the things that we preach is, and I had, <coughs> I had to come to terms with, as a preacher, with people coming up and complimenting you on the sermon. And I would say, to God be the glory. And I learned to say, thank you, to God be the glory. Because no matter what we do in this life, God deserves the praise. Amen. Too many of us are just thankful in general. We need to remind us to, to whom we are grateful to. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Not the American way of life, not the government in Washington, D.C., or the government in Trenton, New Jersey, not our family, not our investments, or our education, but to God and God alone. We owe God an attitude of gratitude. Carl Marx has declared his convictions that basically and radically, radically, all sin is simply ingratitude toward God. You remember the story of the ten lepers that Jesus healed? And how nine of them rejoiced and went away, but only one came to Jesus and thanked him. John Calvin dismissed the nine with his comment. Poverty and hunger beget faith, and abundance kills. This was true for 90% of the people in this biblical story. Could it be that poverty, hungry, hunger rather, ill health, and human difficulties are spiritually good for 90% of us? Well, that these hardships beget faith? Is it just possible that broken health or broken spirit may be the most fertile ground for spiritual growth that God could ever find? The sacrifice that's acceptable to God is a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. The evidence of Scripture seems to be that there was one kind of person that responded quickly to the good news of Christ. When we search our Bibles, it becomes evident that one sort of person is usually the first to come forward and give his life to Christ. Again and again, when you read the Gospel, it becomes abundantly clear that one type of personality is consistently first in line when eternal life is handed out by God. And that one personality, that one person, that one kind of individual is the one who knew himself to be in some kind of need. I've discovered on this Christian journey, most folk don't come to Christ unless they got a need. Most folk don't bother with church until they have a need. In the scriptures, sometimes it was being blind. Sometimes it was being crippled. Sometimes it was an emotional illness. And sometimes it was simply poor, being poor. Another time it was those with physical illness. Sometimes it was men, and sometimes it was women. But all the time, the first ones to give their lives to Christ were people in some kind of physical or emotional need who were going through some kind of great traumatic experience. The statement of John Calvin that poverty and hunger begot faith and abundance kills it seems to me to be too limiting. Not only poverty and hunger, but people with all kinds of brokenness are the first to respond to this need for something better. The sacrifices acceptable to God is a broken and contrite heart. Listen, I don't wish to romanticize those of us who have had health problems. I don't wish to romanticize those of us who are struggling with emotional problems. We all have or have had both. It is merely a matter of degree that separates the hospitalized from those who are not in the hospital. Sickness is never fun. It's always a struggle. And if it is terminal illness, it can be the most difficult time. 
But all of us who have ever been through either or both must confess that such an experience certainly focuses the mind. Yeah, you get sick, you get real focused. Amen. Amen. You don't have time to read the Bible, no time to pray, no time to come to church. Too many things going on in your life, and then sickness comes. All of a sudden, it becomes crystal clear what one ought to do and where one ought to go. <coughs> when sickness comes to us, it can focus the mind, and such an experience can make us re-examine our lives and forces us to take a new look at why we're here. Some of us don't even think about why we're here until we feel like we're getting ready to go. <coughs> you hear me? We don't give much thought to it. Here to enjoy life, here to make a living, here to have fun, and, and we march through life just, just that way until we get worried that our time is about us. Then we get really serious about why we're here. I want to understand God's will for my life. I want to know God's plan for my life. Well, you didn't live most of it. <laughs> the flip side of this truth is that the proud and the arrogant the strong and independent, those who think they don't need anyone, are often the last to respond to Christian faith. They think all of their human needs can be met on the human level. They don't need Christ to heal them. They don't need to go to the right hospital, know the right doctors. That's all they need to do. They don't need any other reason for living other than satisfying their own happiness. They Flip through, one, flip through one trip to another, from one new experience to another, seeking fulfillment and always coming up short. They join clubs and, and political organizations, but they never really come to terms with their reason for living. The secure, the educated, the clean and the washed, the protected, the privileged, the pretty, the powerful, are often the ones who have most trouble seeing any need in their lives for such a demanding person as Jesus Christ. It is a demand on us, isn't it? Amen. Oh yeah, when you come to Jesus, he doesn't just want you to come. He demands your everything. Amen. That becomes problematic for us. I can't spend my time around church folks doing all that churchy stuff. I got things to do with my life. <coughs> I have places to go with people to see. I can't get caught up with those Christian people. All they want to do is talk about the Lord. All they want to do is praise Him and sing His songs. All they want to do is go to church for this and church for that. You know, it's so different today. It really is. Most of us come to church once a week. Amen. We come on Sunday. We think we've done a good thing. We get in our cars and go home and say, I went to church this morning. I love the Lord and the Lord loved me. Amen. Amen. But coming to church, I remember, was almost a daily thing. When I was a little boy, if it wasn't my grandmother dragging me to church, it was my father demanding me to go to church. If it didn't happen on Monday, it happened on Tuesday. Why rehearsal, prayer meeting, yeah. Christian youth fellowship meetings, I had meeting after meeting, there was always something going on at the church. And it demanded your time, your energy, and your commitment. How far we move, we moved away from that? Listen, Reverend, if I come to church once a, once a week, don't demand, don't be looking for me to no meeting now. I'm in the church. But I got other things to do with my life. I'm not like some of them churchy folks. But guess what? There may come a day when you wish you were in this house every day of your life. There's some folk who wish they could get here. They just would love to be in the house one more time. So you're blessed. 
in our brokenness. I need you to know that life may not be so bad. That being broken in health and spirit may not be so bad. Spiritually speaking, and, and, and really that's the only language that we should be speaking this morning, is spiritual speaking. I mean, no one, it's no one's first choice that we be broken. How many of us want to be broken this morning? Yeah, no. Nobody wants to be broken. How many of us want to be broken in health? Broken in spirit. There's no desire to be broken. But I need you to know that we need to be broken. What are you talking about, bro? If that's the best way for God to reach us, then we need to say, break me. Break my health. Break my spirit. Use me as you desire. I tell you, my brothers and sisters, life is too short to ask for anything else. What is acceptable to God? A broken spirit. You know, I like to look at various translations of the Bible and, and, and to see how others translate them. Keep in mind, in the New Testament times, Jesus spoke in Aramaic. And the New Testament was written in Greek. And then we have all the various English translations, some by committee, like the Revised Standard Version, or political edict of a king, like King James Version, the ones in our home, on our coffee table, that collect the dust. <laughs> and some by individuals, like J.B. Phillips and the Living Bible. <coughs> the Old Testament, the translation, is not only from Hebrew to English, but also from a culture quite strange and different from our modern day. And this is why I find it instructive to look at various authors struggling with a specific test. Here's an example, Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit. Another reads, my sacrifice, my God, is a shattered spirit, a broken, a heartbroken and crushed, O oh God, that I will not despise. Another reads, a wounded heart, O oh God, that I will not despise. Another reads, a broken and sorrowing heart, O oh God, you will put from me. The Bible is simply saying the same thing. If you're broken this morning, that's not bad, spiritually speaking. If you're crushed, if you're sorrowing, now may be your window of opportunity to let the light of the world shine into your life. Focus on your reason for being. Rethink what you're doing. Re-examine your lifestyle. Take another look at the direction in which your life is going. Now may be the time of your salvation. Now, even now. <coughs> I know that some of us came to church this morning because it's Sunday. That's what we do on Sunday. We go to church. I know that some of us came to church this morning because we have a duty or a responsibility. So it does have to be here this morning. You have to prepare the table yesterday and be ready to serve it today. So you came. Some of us felt a duty to the choir, so we came. Some of us felt a duty to the usher board, so we came. But I need you to know that for whatever reason you came, God had one better. That God this morning would speak to you about who you are, where you are, in your brokenness. Oh, we don't always see that folk are broken. You know, when we come to church, we put on our Sunday go to meeting clothes. That means we smile. You know, we say praise the Lord. You know, somebody might wave their hand. Every once in a while we'll get up. But we don't put we put on our Sunday go to meeting clothes and not our real clothes. Some of us are wearing a smile right now and our hearts are breaking on the inside. Some of us are smiling, but we are broken in body. We can't do what we used to do. You know, well, I'm learning from Elijah that I can't do what I used to do. I'm learning fast. When you get ready to go, Papa wants to take it slow. <laughs> 
But God will take you in your brokenness and make you whole this morning. God will take your broken heart and mend it back together. God will take your broken body and make it feel all right. God will take your broken spirit and lift it out of the muck and mire. God will take your brokenness and change your life forever. This morning, this very hour, God wants to fix your brokenness. Matter of fact, he lets you get broken in order that he might fix you. He knew you couldn't hear this to him. You couldn't hear his voice. Too much going on in your life. But once we get broken, our focus changes. Once we get broken, we start fixing our eyes on the way out and the way up. And I suggest to you today that your way out and your way up has been found at the foot of the cross. That in Christ Jesus, God takes our brokenness, takes our Folk make their way out 
In spite of what they're going through, God's spirit shines more brightly through them. When I hear folk give encouragement, though they're in the midst of their own suffering, God's spirit shines more brightly through them. Yes. You might have some hardships, you might have some calamities, but I need you to know that God is able to move in the midst of your brokenness. That sometimes the only way he gets our attention is that we become broken. But when we're whole, we can do a whole lot. You know, when everything's gone right in your world, you don't do much praying. Amen. Amen. We don't. When everything's gone right in our world, we give God a table blessing. You know, we might give him a word when we get ready to go to bed. Some of us might get up in the morning and say, thank you, Jesus. But we really don't commune with God. But let trouble come. Yes. Let sickness come. Yes. Let heartache come. Let disappointment come. Yes. And you, all of a sudden, remember who Jesus is. Somebody said here this morning, you've been broken. You've been broken, and you're not talking about it. Someone hurt you emotionally. You've been broken, and you're not talking about it. Some situation messed up your world. Broken, but you're not talking about it. I came by to bring you some good news. You don't have to talk about your brokenness. But there is somebody who can fix Amen. your brokenness. Yeah. Somebody who will take the scattered pieces of your life, mend them back together, Amen. and you'll be stronger and better for it. Yes. Yes. <coughs> if man works on you, you can't improve. You know, some of us walking around here know you. If man, if you lose some teeth, and man gives you some substitute teeth. Don't depend on them judges. They let you down when you need them the most. When I had my surgery and they split me down the middle, this has never been as strong as it was before they split me. I can feel the difference when I press on. Man can't fix things totally. They only do the best that they can. Amen. But God's spirit, when he fixes it, yes. it's better than it was yes. before. Yes. That's why when we give ourselves to him, he always sends us back better than we were before we gave ourselves to him. Some of you can testify to that. So we say, Reverend, I was a snake in the grass. We don't want to say that one. And Jesus touched me and transformed my wickedness into an act of grace. Some of us can say this morning, I ran to and fro, and nothing could hold me down until I met Jesus. And he changed my life forever. The ones would say, I couldn't find peace. I was always hurting until I met Jesus. And he gave me a peace that passes understanding. Listen, you don't have to get it together. You can. You just have to turn it over to a God who's ready to mend up, mend our brokenness, whether physical 